Einen schönen guten Abend und herzlich willkommen hier im Kino des Deutschen Filmmuseums zu unserer Lecture-Reihe Selbstporträts von anderen, das Universum von Agnes Varda. Und ja, wenn Sie jetzt schon vieles verfolgt haben in dieser Reihe, wir sind ja schon bei der elften Veranstaltung seit Oktober letzten Jahres, machen wir diese Reihe zusammen mit der Goethe-Universität. Ähm, und das ist wirklich toll. Heute gibt es nochmal was ganz anderes oder in diesem Monat sogar. Denn Agnes Wada hat ja äh, einige Teile ihres Lebens in Los Angeles verbracht und darüber natürlich auch Filme gemacht. Heute ist der erste Film dazu, da schon mal zu sagen, äh, in einer ganz tollen Qualität von den Farben und dem Ton her, Mür Mür, den wir nachher sehen. Und äh, vorher gibt es noch als Vorfilm, das wurde extra ausgewählt von unserer Referentin, die auch extra aus L.A. heute kommt, also der weitest angereiste Gast der ganzen Reihe, ähm, Get Out of the Car von Tom Anderson und den gibt es dann in einer 16mm Kopie, die wir uns aus Großbritannien von den Lux Studios haben zuschicken lassen. Auch das hoffentlich in einer ganz guten Qualität, dass es ein schöner Abend für uns alle wird. Bevor jetzt Marc Siegel gleich Rita Gonzalez vorstellen wird, äh, möchte ich noch auf das, auf das Begleitprogramm eingehen, das wir jeden Monat zu dieser Reihe machen. Mittwochs und Samstags um 18 Uhr ist das. Und ja, diesmal ist es natürlich auch dem Thema L.A. und Agnes Wada gewidmet im weitesten Sinne. Ähm, wir zeigen zu dem gerade eben erwähnten Tom Anderson seinen... Ja, einen seiner berühmtesten Langfilme, Los Angeles Place Itself, ähm, den ich ihn sehr ans Herz legen möchte am 11. Juni, Samstag, weil ähm, ja, aus Filmausschnitten aus der Filmgeschichte er die Stadt Los Angeles porträtiert. Äh, sieht man sehr, sehr selten, kann ich ihn nur ans Herz legen. Ebenso darüber hinaus Model Shop von Jacques Demy, dem Ehemann von Agnes Wahr. Das heißt, das ist der Film, der parallel zu dem Film, den Sie heute sehen, von ihm entstanden ist in Los Angeles. Und zu guter Letzt ähm, Killer of Sheep, äh, in diesem Monat auch ein ganz, ganz wunderbarer Film über, äh, von Charles Burnett, äh, über die Exploitation bewegung und ja, allesamt Raritäten, die ich Ihnen wirklich ans Herz legen möchte und aber jetzt erstmal geht's los mit einem wunderbaren Abend mit Mür Mür und Rita Gonzales und begrüßen Sie Marc Siegel. Danke, danke Urs. When Vincent Heidegger and I were discussing people to invite for this Varda lecture and film series, Rita Gonzales was the first person who came to my mind. It's an honor that she was able to um, come all the way from Los Angeles to be here with us. Rita is someone who at home in both the film and art worlds, and as such, she's well situated to contribute to our discussions about Varda's intermedial work. She curated the first museum show in the United States on Varda, Agnes Varda in California land at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art in 2013. Rita's worked at LACMA, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, regularly since 2004, first on a part-time basis as a curatorial assistant, and now full-time as curator and interim head of contemporary art. She's curated or co-curated some groundbreaking shows that I wish I would have seen, um, but we many of us got to hear a bit about last night at the Städel Schule. Um, shows including Phantom Sightings, Art After the Chicano Movement, and ASCO, Elite of the Obscure, about the innovative LA-based Chicano performance collective, ASCO. When I first ran into Rita in the 90s Los Angeles art scene, it was in the context of experimental film and video She was active as a programmer and video maker, and we shared an interest in the 1960s New York underground scene around Jack Smith and Andy Warhol. But what set Rita apart from most of us who were discovering the queer possibilities of the subculture was her research into the contributions of Puerto Rican artists to this avant-garde, specifically the work of drag superstar Mario Montez and director Jose Rodriguez Soltero. Rita's attention to the work of Latino, Latina, and Chicano, Chicana artists both highlights historical erasures and elisions, and, if you will, provincializes conventional art and film historical discourse. Towards the end of the 1990s, 
Rita curated, co-curated Mexperimental, a pioneering survey of experimental media from Mexico that traveled to museums and festivals internationally and culminated in a publication. She has an MFA from the University of California at San Diego and a degree in film and media studies from the same program I attended um, at UCLA. She's one of those rare beings, someone who both lives and was born in Los Angeles. Moreover, she's one of the few curators of contemporary art at a major museum in the United States with a solid background in film history and film studies. And for both of these reasons, she will certainly have a lot to tell us about the murmurings behind Murmur. Please join me in welcoming Rita Gonzalez. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That was such a beautiful introduction. And thank you, Urs, too, for all and your stuff here, for all of your work and making me feel so at home. Um, it's such a pleasure to be able to pay tribute to Anya Svarda, as you all have been continuing um, to do, I guess, returning for some of you who have been return visitors to see these films. And I got to spend a, a short amount of time in, with her uh, in preparation for the exhibition that we did at the LA County Museum of Art, uh, as Mark mentioned. So it was uh, really out of a, a very selfish um, need of my own to meet uh, Agnes and to reach out to her. And because I've been particularly interested in the time that she spent in California so that's what I'm going to be talking about today in the context of the films that we'll see tonight. Uh, I am screening, or we are screening, uh, Agnes Varda's Murmur and also Tom Anderson's Get Out of the Car, which I added on, and hopefully you'll see after I give the lecture and you see the films, the dialogue, um, and the way in which Tom, Tom Anderson is obviously uh, paying an homage to, to Agnes, uh, Agnes's Murmurs. So let me grab that. the writing in progress that I'm sharing today uh, first emerged from curatorial research uh, into a history of exhibitions at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. It's a 50 year old encyclopedic museum located in the mid city of a sprawling centerless metropolis. LACMA has a relatively short history and, uh, and although early on the board of trustees was for the most part averse to a dialogue with living artists and the potential for a range of voices within the museum, there were occasions of innovative curatorial collaborations and responses to the growing civil rights activism of the 1960s in the United States. 1965 was, after all, both the time that the museum arrived on the cultural landscape and the year of the Watts riots. Oddly at the same time, but certainly not, uh, but certainly on the fringes of its more conservative presentation of uh, canonical Western art history, LACMA did present a number of exhibitions with strong links to the films that we are screening this evening. For me, the exhibitions that I'll mention briefly that all took place at LACMA in the late 60s and through the mid 70s, Los Four, Seymour Rosen's I Am Alive Toward an Awareness of and Participation with the Environment, and a presentation of the collective Environmental Communications served as prologues to two exhibitions that I've worked on um, that Mark mentioned. Osco, A Lead of the Obscure, that was co-curated with Andine Shavoya and Anya Svarda in California land. Here's just a little LA through its freeways um, to give you a sense of the sprawl that is Los Angeles. OSCO, a Chicano art group that produced performances, urban interventions, drawings, paintings, photography, and writings from roughly 1970 up through the late 1980s, were experimenters who described their aesthetics as a combination of glitter and gangrene. OSCO are featured toward the end of Murmurs with a performance uh, done especially, a commission especially by Agnes, entitled Death of Fashion.
Varda has been called um, Varda has been called, and I would offer the same for LA-based filmmaker Tom Anderson, a profound advocate for the archival capacity of cinema. The deeply intuitive and empathetic Varda has always been the documenteur, the gleaner, the lover of the un or miscast. Um, Get out of the car, the voice of R&B musician Richard Berry implores at the beginning of Tom Anderson's eponymous film. And so the filmmaker does in search of the signs, signs that say we are here by the most recent and not so recent immigrants who populate Los Angeles and ones that signal the loss of historical sites where earlier generations of multi-ethnic communities once commingled. In Murmurs, one exits the automobile to enter into what California artist Terry Schoenhoven describes as an immersive dreamscape created by the thousands of murals on the walls. Both films present a street-level portrait of Los Angeles, distinct in point of view and immersed in the visual and audiophonic multiplicity of the city. Varda calls Murmur an extroverted film on Los Angeles. Documenteur, made shortly after, is the introverted partner. Murmur and Documenteur were Varda's return to Los Angeles, where in 1969 she had made Lion's Love, a free-form narrative film with Warhol superstar Viva and experimental filmmaker Shirley Clark. I think Mark Siegel's going to be presenting that relatively soon. Murmurs begins with, with Varda musing about the typical establishing shots of Los Angeles, especially the golden-haired surfers on the beaches that she calls angels. But Varda's take is uh, a subtle and complex understanding of the multiple stakes of the mural form. It's a departure then from the, the sort of typical images, uh, the surfers and so on. It is in part the hippie Christian approach of Kent Twitchell's The Holy Trinity mural, in which the artist used television stars remembered from his childhood as models for his mess messianic visions. Or it might be the phantasmatic approach of the Chicano muralist Wayne Healy in Ghosts of the Barrio that you saw in the first slide, imagining a mestizo coexistence in which cholos, conquistadors, and Aztec warriors stand side by side. As art historian Marcos Sanchez Tronquelino has noted in his studies, Murales del Movimiento, Chicano Murals and the Discourses of Art and Americanization, Chicanismo, quote, was a complex of nationalist strategies by which origins and histories, as well as present and future identities, were constructed and legitimized. Furthermore, it provided a context for historical reclamation of the self through affirmation of Chicano cultural narratives while resisting Anglo models of assimilation. End quote. Murmurs begins with a Mexican-American boy standing in front of a vivid and color-streaked wall of names. These are plaqueazos, or plaques, designating affiliations to territories and gangs. As Varda notes in her voiceover, these are the words on the walls of Los Angeles that say, I exist and I sign what's mine. Los Four in 1974 was the first major museum presentation of Chicano art in the United States, actually internationally <laughs> in the world. Uh, Chicano art is a term, term taken by politicized artists of Mexican descent, many of whom felt affinities, but a certain rejection from both cultural a Mexican cultural elitism, and the mechanisms of American power, in particular political representation. In art historian Tomás Ibarra Frausto's essay, The Chicano Movement, The Movement of Chicano Art, the author points out that alongside the struggles and activism, the movement existed to catalyze cultural expression. The Chicano movement provided the momentum for the early development of cultural centers and the creation of the project, quote unquote. Defining the terms of the project, Ibarra Frausto maintained that, quote, the practices of daily life and the lived environment were primary constituent elements of the new aesthetic. So this new, fl this fluidity between working class labor, a political and labor-based movement, and creative expression was fundamental to Chicano art. And the ex exhibition that you see here, Los Four, was, compri was comprised of an extensive list 
of paintings, sculptures, plaqueazos, or tags, graffiti tags, flowers, and other ritual displays associated with Catholic or perhaps more syncretic forms of ritual and prayer. Um, thinking of here the, the altar that was brought to the museum galleries by the artists. Uh, the transcultural and bilingual merging of indigenous practices of the Americas, Latin American colonial legacies, uh, as, as well as signals of the repression in the United States, mixed together with Hollywood popular culture, comic book aesthetics, uh, rock, rock and, and rhythm and blues musical forms, and a strong graphic tradition found in everything from sign painting to muralism are key components of Chicano visual and audiophonic culture. As Agnes Varda so astutely documents and describes the everyday existence of urban Los Angeles life with and according to the murals, so too do Los Four, this collective of Chicano artists, give us a sense of their practice as it seeks to move fluidly from an active, collective, semi-privatized space of their studio to the public sphere. And for context, I would like to screen just two minutes from a documentary film made by James Tartan the same year of their exhibition. Uh, so have the first clip, please. So you see in these, in these images of the exhibition and from the, the film clip, the really kind of staging of their collective practice and its transfer, its transfer into uh, an exhibition format, which during the run of the exhibition would unfold and more works would be added, some taken away, um, which made it a very living kind of collective activity. Two other exhibitions that took place in 1966 and 1977 at LACMA are worth bearing in mind. Uh, Seymour Rosen's I Am Alive, Toward an Awareness of and Participation with Environment, and an installation by the collective Environmental Communications called Environmental Communications Looks at Los Angeles. Rosen and Environmental Communications were advocates for texture and place. Rosen, a photographer, spent his professional life from the 1960s up to his death in 2006 chronicling folk environments subcultures and the built environment. In the 1966 show at LACMA, Rosen, quote, filled shipping crates with found items, including a smashed can, bread, light bulb filaments, and a National Geographic Museum open to a story on cave dwellings, or cave drawings. And you see also some of the other uh, materials that he was drawing from, from for his exhibition, including uh, graffiti, the human body, happenings, junk, things. This unorthodox, unorthodox approach to exhibition make, making, one that was actually quite in sync with European curator Erl Zeman, argued for a broad and interdisciplinary approach, one that many artists of the time were making globally through such music, movements as Arte Povera in Italy and Tropicalia in Brazil. I first came across Rosen while researching, um, sorry, I was gonna, yeah, this one. I first came across Rosen while researching the group ASCO, who I mentioned, whose first public performance, Stations of the Cross, was a one-mile procession along Whittier Boulevard, which is a very busy, busy avenue in Los Angeles, uh, in East Los Angeles, during the holiday season in 1971 iconoclastically transforming the Mexican Catholic tradition of Las Posadas into a ritual of remembrance and resistance against the deaths in Vietnam. The procession consisted of Harry Gamboa, Gronk, artist went by one name, Gronk, and Willy Heron, who carried a 15-foot cross that had been constructed out of cardboard and layered with paint. The final rite was held in front of the Marine Corps Recruiting Center where the costume trio observed a ceremonial five minutes of silence before placing the cross at the door of the station and fleeing the scene. Coincidentally, photographer Seymour Rosen, the founder of SPACES, which stands for Saving and Preserving Arts and Cultural Environments, uh, an organization that among other things was partially responsible for the preservation of Simon Rodia's Watts Towers, was on Whittier Boulevard looking to photograph something quote-unquote traditionally Chicano associated with the holidays. 
Instead, Rosen found himself documenting what would be the what would be Osco's first manifestation of their ideas in the public sphere. In the 1970s, uh, Rosen became increasingly interested in photographing vernacular art environments and spontaneous happenings. In 1976, the groundbreaking exhibition of these images in celebration of ourselves was presented at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. An accompanying book was published in 1979 containing, like the exhibit, images of Stations of the Cross. In the book, a shot of Gronk as an invented persona known as Popcorn is placed within a dynamic light layout with a caption that reads, Stations of the Cross, Happening, East Los Angeles, 1971. On the page, Stations is presented as a happening among other photographs that include a stylish, a, a stylish San Francisco hippie, a, a horseman costumed in traditional Japanese military attire during a Japanese New Year's parade, and a couple with matching Harlequin makeup, participants in an event called the Freak Ball in Los Angeles. And this is a, a, another image by Seymour Rosen. Uh, he shot also many images of storefront architecture or storefront uh, buildings like this that had been converted into spaces of worship. So this is a, uh, a church like you still see today very often in Los Angeles. Like Rosen and later Varda and Anderson, the members of Environmental Communications traveled to California functioning, to borrow a phrase from geographer and urban theorist Edward Soja, as, quote, practiced readers of surface geographies. Environmental Communications, a group of architects and urban planners, were active from 1969 through 1982 and created image archives of a lawn inventory of Southern California, including neon signs, graffiti, and murals. Soja has argued that, quote, Los Angeles has attracted observant readers after a history of neglect and misapprehension, for it insistently presents itself as one of the most informative palimpsests and paradigms of the 20th century urban industrial development of popular consciousness. Environmental communications installation at LACMA part of a larger exhibition entitled California Four Footnotes to Modern Art History, presented a slide inventory of the city's eccentric overabundance of visuality, from giant McDonald's hamburgers attacking the city streets from billboards to the writing and painting on its walls. And I'm just going to show about five minutes from this slide, uh, slide review that was presented as an installation, multimedia installation in the galleries. We're ready for the clip. Operating in, a, in Venice Beach, a neighborhood featured in Varda's Murmurs as she traverses what she says, Los Angeles to Los Angeles, Los Angeles West. Environmental communication studio and later hybrid bookshop was a sto stone's throw away from a pivotal location in Orson Welles' Touch of Evil. With this knowledge of the palimpsestic space in which they operated, Environmental communication set out to document the collision of architectural styles, countercultural energies, and the commercial landscapes that dominated their field of vision. Quite, quite like the Art Architectural Ant Farm Collective, who hailed from the Bay Area and were active during the same period, environmental communications had a pedagogical thrust and offered for rental these slide programs to, to uh, schools and interested individuals. These artistic and documentation projects were and remain on the fringes of institutionalized art history and museum collecting practices, but I would argue their legacy is seen in the films we will see tonight, and certainly in a wide range of cultural phenomenon from postmodern studies of urbanism up through the writings of Mike Davis, uh, Edward Soja, Raul Villa, and also in the work of countless, of art, countless artists working in Los Angeles today. These exhibitions were unbeknownst to Agnes Varda, who actually unsuccessfully reached out to both the curatorial department and a librarian at LACMA in search of an expert on muralism. When she couldn't find one, she decided to document the murals, some in imminent danger of disappearance, as well as track down as many muralists she could find. Um, in 1972, when Rainer Banham came to Los Angeles to elaborate on his radio document documentary for a film, 
The first thing he did at LAX was to hop in a car. Anderson's filmmaking, ironically, had to rely on a car in order to traverse the city as widely as his film does. But he departs from Banham's exaltation of three of the four ecologies of Los Angeles by focusing on the corridors of industry and working and middle-class suburban neighborhoods that are not often featured in mainstream media. In Anderson's Get Out of the Car, there is a very definite possibility of getting lost or at the very least entering into some liminal time zone where, to quote the city motto of L.A. suburb El Monte, featured in his, mu- in his film, the future meets the past. Anderson seems to invoke the temporality of the Angelino neorealism that in his magnum opus Los Angeles plays itself, he connected to Kent McKenzie and the African filmmakers associated with the L.A. rebellion, namely Charles Burnett, whose films you'll be screening, Haile Jarima, Julie Dash, and others. In Los Angeles Plays Itself, Anderson's alter ego narrator describes this alternate temporality as, quote, a spatial, spatialized, non-chronological time of meditation and memory. In a perpetually sun-soaked Los Angeles, Anderson and his camera persons, one of whom is filmmaker Deborah St- Stratman, rove the terrain less documented by Hollywood films. The cities are El Monte, Alhambra, Downey, Watts, and find numerous memory-tinged locations. The mostly static shots are sidewalk views, looking close up at a sun-streaked fading mural of the Virgin of Guadalupe on an automotive shop, or through the chain-link fence of a famous old restaurant that is threatened with destruction. Anderson's opening titles describe the film as a city, quote, a city symphony in 16 millimeter composed from advertising signs, building facades, fragments of music and conversation, and unmarked sites of vanished cultural landmarks. More than Anderson's self-proclaimed city symphony, Get Out of the Car seems like a lengthy dedication murmured on a late-night radio show. One of the longest sequences is in fact an homage to a DJ, Art Lebeau a veteran of the radio format in Los Angeles going back to the 1960s, who still has a large following of mostly Chicano and African-American listeners. In a particular personal dedication in the film, Tom Anderson stands outside of the El Monte Legion Stadium, former music venue for rhythm and blues and doo-wop musicians. To the strains of a song called Memories of El Monte, a nostalgic novelty song penned by Frank Zappa and Ray Collins, Anderson shows snapshots of dances and concerts that took place in the now destroyed building. A radiophonic memory propels the soundtrack. Music is purposefully recorded to sound like it's wafting out of a car or overheard on a street corner. This is true as well of of Anya Svarta's film. Sounds create mysterious juxtapositions even within themselves as we hear a Spanish-language version of the U.S. country music hit Achy Breaky Heart. First Chance Operation, uh, to evoke Anderson's own linking of spatial and sonic memories, it came, as he said, it came into my mind that I can still remember hearing certain songs in certain places even 50 years later. Run Around Sue in a San Francisco bus station, Willie in a hand jive, in a beachfront hamburger stand in Santa Monica. I wanted to evoke these memories. As the soundscape creates the notion of Los Angeles as a palimpsestic city, Anderson calls our attention to the layered forms in the visual landscape. Billboards peel and release hidden statements. Graffiti taggers bomb a church in South Central designed by Rudolf Schindler. And commemorative signs concocted by the filmmaker serve as cautionary tales to a city known for its perpetual amnesia. And I just wanted to point out the, the sign at the top that uh, Anderson concocted for the film. He pays homage to Colby Signs, a family-run printing company that was for five decades used by generations of West Coast artists, including Ed Ruscha, uh, and here's some examples, uh, Al Rupersberg, Eve Fowler, Daniel J. Martinez, Dave Muller, and many others. Anderson uses the Colby signs as a temporary phantom monument that, that, align, uh, that align, aligns past and present. 
In Varda's film, a chorus of whisperer, whisper, right? a whisper, I should say, uh, calls out the name names of each mural mural artists. In this case, the black and white mural by members of Asco, Gronk, and Willy Heron. Many of the murals documented in Mermers uh, are are either gone or in very fragile condition now. A city ordinance decreed in 1986 as an attempt to depopulate billboards was until recently applied to murals, therefore rendering any large-scale paintings illegal until very recently. Anderson's film captures privately owned businesses attempting to keep the mural tradition alive, albeit in a hybridized form that sometimes awkwardly puts hand-painted business signage side by side with Jesus's crucifixion. Uh, or graffiti alongside Mexican revolutionary figures. To describe this complex arrangement of sacred and profane symbolism, Anderson has pointed to film theorist Peter Wallen's essay, Into the Future, Tourism, Language, and Art. Wallen concludes the essay thusly, Modernism is being succeeded, not by a totalizing Western postmodernism, excuse me, but by a hybrid new aesthetic in which the new corporate forms of communication and display will be constantly confronted by new vernacular forms of invention and expression. Creativity always comes from beneath. It always finds an unexpected and indirect path forward, and it always makes use of what it can scavenge, scavenge by night. End quote. Both Varda and Anderson share an insatiable curiosity for the lesser known but truly distinctive aspects of Los Angeles. Seeing these two films in one screening is a bit like getting lost in the city, losing, if just for an ecstatic moment, the sense of where the past meets the future. So I'll end there and uh, invite Urs to start the films. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. For the great presentation. Ja, und wir machen jetzt wie immer eine kurze Pause von circa 10 Minuten. Das Filmcafé hat auch noch geöffnet. Sie können sich nochmal mit Getränken ausstatten und dann begeben wir uns auf die Reise nach Los Angeles. Ja, das war Mühe Mühe und please welcome again Rita Gonzalez and Mark Siegel on stage. Ein Applaus. Rita, um, thank you so much for this program. It was great to see both of these films together, um, neither of which I'd seen before. Um, maybe um, my first question, I'm thinking about the um, Mur Mur. Um, it, it's obviously a film that's documenting these murals, um, but at the same time, we see the kind of typically Varda interest in, in, um, in, in an image and and reality, or in um, the dif yeah, difference between representation and real life. Um, and, um, and so I w that, that seemed to me a, a quite a contrast to Tom Anderson's film, in which, um, in which he seems less interested in, in people in relation to representation, mm -hmm. um, and we don't even get to see people. Um, but instead, in re we just see the kind of remnants of, of of existence. Um, do, you, do you have any um, thoughts about this this juxtaposition? I mean, I, I mean, to push this a little bit, it, if you will, is is Tom Anderson's film anti-humanist, <laughs> or is it? Is it? I mean, is there a kind of um, there? There seems to be a, a kind of not like Avarda's um, fascination for engaging with people mm -hmm. comes through, whereas Anderson is much more. Um, is less interested, it seems to me, in in the the people. Right. We even almost have a kind of cynical, joking relationship to their voices when they intervene. Mm -hmm. um, if you can maybe shed some more light on this, on the the differences maybe between the two films and their approach to to signs, to images. Mm -hmm. um, I would say it, it's a kind it's of a, comes down to a difference in the the personality of the personalities of, of the filmmakers mm -hmm. and also the, the periods of time in which these were produced. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would also say that uh, Anya Svarda, if you notice, there's a, a woman 
that appears throughout the film, mm -hmm. who sort of, um, it's, the, it's the actress, actor, Juliette Bertrand, the French actress, mm -hmm. who is kind of a uh, surrogate for Agnès, who you sometimes hear asking questions, but it's really, Juliette sometimes asks the questions and also is figured in sort of as a, a representative. Um, whereas with Tom Anderson, Tom Anderson's film actually started as a as more of an inventory. It started with you see at the very beginning is was shot in two different periods of time, so it was it was shot first as a sort of just kind of a, a chronicle of these empty billboards mm -hmm. that he was fascinated with, and more the more the sort of terms of their for him kind of significance in a very abstracted way that they marked um, the spaces for for him in which he moved. And then he made this decision that he was going to be more strict about the documentation, but he was traveling in areas that he didn't typically work or you know didn't live in and mm -hmm. work in. Uh, like he writes about this in a, a really wonderful essay that you can anyone can read online. Um, his his typical transit was from his house in in Silver Lake to where he teaches at Cal Arts, and this was taking him through all of these neighborhoods in South Central. Um, you see Watts, you see different uh, the kind of outskirts of the industrial parts of downtown Los Angeles. You see East Los Angeles, you see El Monte, places where he didn't feel like he had like real relationships per mm -hmm. se to individuals and the whole thing of get out of the car means something completely different for to Anya Svarta as you're as you're mentioning mm -hmm. where she actually wanted to document um in a way where she was you know when she was calling the museum and saying can you please tell me more about this history of muralism mm -hmm. she couldn't find it so she was doing also a series of oral histories interviews um, the kind of personal dynamics that were at play for her then were elaborated in Documenture, which I think some of you have seen as well. Uh, so I think they're just two they're very different approaches mm -hmm, as filmmakers. Mm -hmm. yeah. One more gregarious, as she said, extroverted, the sort of uh -huh. extroverted depiction of, of, uh, of Los Angeles and Tom Anderson's, which is much more internal, mm -hmm. where he's has a very much uh, m more kind of psychological response to these spaces. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think it's the, the juxtaposition became really interesting for me because it showed to me um, how like Varda's um, fascination, not just for the works themselves um, as artworks, um, but for the people who made them, for yeah. the conditions under which they worked, yeah, for the amount of time that they took, for the care that's given to them afterwards. Right. Um, and um, and in in the kind of or or the lack of care. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I, I mean I don't want to push the connection, um, but just because you put them in the program, it it, it sort of um, it's leaked after hand. It's just sort of present. Um, Anderson really um, doesn't give us any kind of social, political, economic. I think he does a little the, bit, maybe with the signs, the music. but I, I think he ah, he, the really, music. Okay. he pushes for the music to tell the story. So mm -hmm. he uses the the very strong history of African American, um, actually the kind of very multicultural mm -hmm. kind of um, collaborations that were part of rhythm and blues, rock and roll, the history of rock and roll. Um, uh, he plays a lot of Mexican music, mm -hmm. me rock and español, and norteño music. So if you if you hear it's really he's letting the the music kind of tell these stories mm, mm, and mm. the stories are a lot about displacement of immigrants they're about um crimes of passion they're about transit there's about they're about boredom they're about all of these things and i think he's he's very it seems kind of random the way he's mm -hmm. using the music because mm -hmm. it seems like snippets that he's overhearing but it's very particular the way that he's stitching together the music Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I think Varda did it more with kind of focusing on the Chicano artist Manuel Cruz who s sings the blues and she's interested in that kind of crossover between African American and, and Chicano uh, cultures. Mm -hmm. So hers is a little bit more sociological where, mm -hmm. again, I think Tom Anderson is doesn't want to speak so much in the sense of speaking for, claiming a place, 
but allowing the music that that kind of pervaded his life and speaks to the history of Los Angeles uh, mm-hmm. in a way that these visuals do for him as well. And mm-hmm. his is more elegiac. It's more about loss. Mm-hmm. This is also during a time period when murals were, were banned. I think I mentioned briefly in, in my talk. Mm-hmm. So there weren't any new murals being commissioned. In 2001. Around this, th- yeah, around uh-huh. this time. It, it, it probably changed around the time that he was finishing with the film. Um, and, and that was because uh, at a certain point, um, graffiti and muralism were sort of becoming more and more mm. enmeshed. Mm-hmm. And you saw the graffiti, graffiti taking more and more over the murals. Mm-hmm. And so there was a lot of issues about if a mural was painted, then whoever was responsible for commissioning the mural had to be responsible for keeping it up. And just to sort of issues too about zoning and, mm-hmm, and who mm-hmm. um, was commissioning them in any case it's a that's kind of a long and complicated story but murals are now back and being commissioned but, officially so mm-hmm, this was a period mm-hmm. of time too where he was documenting this this in a way this this loss it's interesting just one last comment and then we can open it up for for more for a bigger discussion um it's interesting that you bring up this, the graffiti in the murals, because after we saw the Tom Anderson film, I somewhat expected with Varda's film that we would get this kind of pure, crystal clear, clean depiction of the murals. Mm-hmm. But um, not only were the murals at that time also tagged, um, lots of graffiti, but Varda um, emphasizes that. Yeah, she appreciated in her, She it appreciated too. that. Yeah. And, and, and it's not even thematized. We don't have the muralist, any muralist, like upset about that yeah um at least they didn't speak about that it's never you would think maybe that that could be something that they would be upset about but it didn't seem like they were do you know more about that did the muralists did the muralists themselves see the tagging as um a violation of their artwork or did they see that as a further extension of the presence of chicanos in public space i think actually very few appreciated it um the mural that you see of willie heron that's called the mirror the, the wall that cracked open that's a case where he actually invited people to tag it mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. it was a case where he wanted that kind of gang violence that um, his brother had been subjugated to when his brother was knifed and that in that site so for him, it was almost a memorial site to this this level of, of violence in the neighborhood. But for the most part, I think graffiti uh, people who were muralists don't want their, don't want mm-hmm, their work. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, that that kind of led to the in a way that censorship and the and the stopping of murals for a long time. And now even with uh, more and more conservation efforts, I think Willie Heron would probably have a, a different perspective and want his work to be more respected and uh, as, as do many other muralists. Mm-hmm. And a lot of, actually, like you see with the, you see the, at the end, the, um, the, the images in Venice, uh, those were done by Terry Shunovan and the Los Angeles Fine Arts Squad. A lot of their murals are gone, you mm-hmm. know, a lot of the murals actually that you see are are gone because of development, real estate development, um, and just the times have changed. So this is a real mm-hmm. document of mm-hmm. Los Angeles that doesn't exist anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sorry, I said I'd open it up. I just have one last teeny little question um, or comment in the in the film. She Varda seemed to focus. I, I mean, you can't. I don't know that there was a a main muralist, but if there was, it seemed to be. Ken Twitchell, uh-huh. um, which to me seems somehow to fit for Varda because he's an illusionist. He's representational. Right. It's very much about uh, a person in relation to the image. Mm-hmm. Um, and But he's also like a white muralist, and mm-hmm. she doesn't necessarily talk about distinctions among the muralists in that way, about mm-hmm. um, competitions or anything like that. But I don't know. So those are two different kinds of questions. But one... Do you was he a more important muralist, or was it simply Varda's interest to focus on this illusionist? Yeah, he muralist? definitely is one of the most uh, significant muralists. He's still around. He's still engaged mm-hmm. with muralism, and he's also been involved in some pretty high-profile lawsuits because a number of his um, murals were were destroyed. Mm-hmm. Um, 
that I, I think she was more interested in, and from what I remember her saying, uh, especially with the mural with the, the Holy Trinity, mm-hmm. is this very strange kind of conflation of the Hollywood, his Hollywood memories or televisual memories mm-hmm. growing up and how he kind of overlays that onto religious Christian symbolism. Mm-hmm. I think that for her was kind of a trip. I mean, in a way, mm-hmm. just, just something she's very interested in. But Twitchell is definitely, mm-hmm. if you actually still in Los Angeles, you'll see on the side of the 101 freeway, on mm-hmm. the 110 freeway, you'll see his freeway, his, you see his murals. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, okay. So, so that, they're still around. And so in a sense, it was a, a legitimate... Yeah, definitely. Sort of, and Judy uh, Baca too, yeah. who's yeah, very yeah. well known still, yeah. and runs a space called Spark, which is a social mm-hmm. social public art resource center in Venice, California, still. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Are there yeah. other questions. further comments or questions? I'm giving me a sign, and I come to you. Yeah, I, um, one thing that came to mind, if you compare both films, was also that I thought uh, Anderson films was more nostalgic of uh, L.A. I mean, mm-hmm. it was kind of like, I was a little bit reminded of, uh, also, I was <laughs> I was reminded a little bit of, it was like a boneyard, you know, like, like the Boneyard Museum in Las yes. Vegas. Yes. But he made it with billboards mm-hmm. <laughs> a little bit, uh, uh, I'd say. And uh, in comparison to that, I think um, Vara has more, um, I don't know, a living history approach. Or I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, I mean, different time periods too, you mm-hmm. know, yeah, yeah. in the early 80s which was still, I would say that it wasn't the height of muralism because a lot of these had been earlier in the 70s, but still the, this, um, the commissioning was active, the, the display of murals was, was very present. So it's something that I think, though, you really have to appreciate the fact that not a, nobody had paid attention to this, even though they were so pervasive and there was such a visual phenomenon. I don't think until she paid attention, well, the, with the exception of the, the things that I'd shown, environmental communications, that group, there really hadn't been that acknowledgement of this as, a, as an art form. Um, and, and maybe it was because of her being an outsider and her, her vision. But it's just, it always struck me as very powerful that at the very beginning when she's saying, you know, really when you think about Southern California, you think of the Hollywood sign, you think of the surfers, you think of very almost cliche, you know, at this point, images of of the West. But for her, it was all about this other landscape that she wanted, you know, that was so visible that it was invisible in a way she wanted to play with. Yeah, I was also thinking about this visible, invisible situation of the murals, and I was interested in what she said at the beginning when we were in the car on the highway, and she said, these are the kind of murals or the kind of artwork that you see when you're not looking, when you're stuck in traffic, or when you're going around the corner or something. And then I was wondering how she then conceptualized staging the murals, because putting them on film and making them into a kind of aesthetic object to be looked at is very Mm. different from how... Um, their original, um, you know, uh, how they were originally conceived and how they were supposed to work with the community. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there's, if she also thought about kind of this power of the unmarked or power of the invisible that remains with these works within the community, within the network, that it's not on a white canvas Mm -hmm. and a white museum, but that you actually have like the texture of the building showing through that they are so site specific. Mm -hmm. Um, and that when they come on film, they kind of like the film announces them as something different Mm -hmm. because we have to look at them. We have close ups, we have narration. And I thought that was interesting how she was juxtaposing those kind of stagings of murals with people juggling or people making out or Mm -hmm. people selling, you know, religious, whatever propaganda or something. Mm -hmm. So did you, talk to her at all about these kind of maybe two different ways of staging murals or documenting them and whether or not she was concerned at all about kind of maybe a, a loss of of political power or potential that these mm. objects had 
Uh, no, I didn't talk to her about that specifically, but I, I've been interested in the way that she had very different approaches, you know, was not one, um, one uh, way in which she approached documenting the mural. So with Asco, it was a performance piece that activated the wall where she was responding to them, their, their artistic gestures. Um, in, in other cases, like with Judy Baca, where it's the portable mural, she decides to take that and make it the moving mural and moves it through the city, and it's very strategic, the places where she goes. She goes to the employment office, in front of the banks, you know, and, and that whole mobilization, which um, apparently was Anya Svarta's idea, and Judy Baca thought it was interesting, but had never thought of it herself, and it was in, not until she kind of instrumentalized this mural, she, she saw Varda's point in doing this. Um, in the and I, I think what Mark was saying too, it struck me again too watching it, how much about how much of this is about the labor and production and that whole critique is also seen, I think, in the way that she documents documents the pieces. Um, where Kent Twitchell is in front of the large mural where he's painted all of the artists on the again on the employment building. This way, she's playing with scale and monumentalism, and she was thinking about him, of course, in relationship to Alice in Wonderland and Jonathan Swift. So that was more that literary conceit that she was playing with there. So I think she just had very different approaches with, with each of these. And I pointed out at the end, it's, it, it, it ends on a still on the Isle of California, and it's, it's actually a still of Anya Svarda playing football with her son, Matthew Demi. And this is actually the beginning. If you go to Documenteur, there's a still, uh, but this time it's the actress pl- kind of playing Anya Svarda and her son now is in a, in a different role, a fictive role, but the same gesture of playing ball in front of that apocalyptic mural. So uh, again, that kind of blurring too of fact and fiction and it's, so easy to do in the in the realm of Los Angeles where it's all about this you know illusionism on top of it illusionism it's interesting with Varda with the, even the two films Documenteur which some of us maybe saw earlier in the series and now Murmur I, I felt that Documenteur like a lot of Varda's work was in a sense about the the window was yes. really like looking out the window onto yes. life outside and then here it's simply looking at walls um, but but in a sense, looking at walls and but the and walls speak back exactly, and finding. Yeah. I find I, I don't know what to do with that, but mm-hmm. I just thought it's something um, to to think through. Is mm-hmm. um, this? And I know I mean sort of biographically that this was her second. It was her second time to to L.A. It was mm-hmm. what like ten years later, mm-hmm. and it was the time when she as that's thematized in Documenter when she was going through a rough time with Jacques Demy, when it was a kind of, mm-hmm. when it could have been a Tom Anderson nostalgic time, mm-hmm. but um, maybe the nostalgic longing you see in Documenter and here you see the hopefulness or a different kind of, um, although I think that's suggested also in Documenter in her interest in, in, in other people, in the, in the people yeah, around there's, her. There's definitely documentary footage that she incorporates into document her mm-hmm. uh, as well but yeah i mean she's she's spoken about this that the extroverted and the introverted films um and she was able to use the the murals in a way to as, as more of a kind of backdrop for mm-hmm. the the drama of mm-hmm. document her Mm-hmm. But she's also much more interested in the silences. Uh, so if Murmurs is about the speaking walls and, and giving people voice, Documentor is really about the unspoken and mm-hmm. what's unspeakable. And she speaks, the character speaks a lot about the pain of, of loneliness and also being a foreigner in uh, a different land too mm-hmm. and trying to just uh, assimilate or make a make sense of a life basically Mm -hmm. and the very kind of common everyday problems that are involved in that like getting a couch um renting an apartment (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know finding finding a babysitter for your child things like that they're very become major dramatic Mm -hmm. events in the film Mm -hmm. 
I think I think there's another um, question. Yeah, this is just a little add-on because I was reminded reminded about the uh, of another film also by a Californian uh, a filmmaker, uh, Stephanie Rothman, The Working Girls from 1974, an exploitation film where seen. one of the main protagonists is an artist painting expressionist paintings. Oh really? And she's earning her money by painting billboards. Wow. And she's painting murals in order to find new um, roommates for her apartments. Oh, what's it called? Uh, the film is called The Working Girls. Oh, okay. And 76. 70, no, 74. Ah. And uh, the mural is also used uh, in the title sequence. And it's also like the oh. bar, um, you know, the, the boxers bar mm -hmm. where the couple is standing in front mm -hmm. and they... Um, have this kind of mirroring effect that's the same mm. uh, with this mural too and um, her prints and including this one are quite uh, were quite I think last at the end of last year by MoMA so they they are going to be available again but it's an exploitation mm -hmm. film it's a, a fiction film but it's because it's, uh, she in 74 as a Californian makes also this connection between billboards um, 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 murals and art and filmmaking <laughs> Thank you. Do you have a copy? <laughs> For me? I have, a, I have it on uh, DVD. Oh, oh okay. okay. Let's check it out. <laughs> Are there other comments about the films, about Rita's presentation? Then I would like to, to know, because our series has uh, this uh, wonderful title, Self-Portraits of Others. How would you comment on that, especially uh, after seeing these two movies or uh, the last one and uh, incomplete because you you uh, yeah, you had to do so much with Agnes personally. How would you see this phenomenon, uh, self-portraits and self-portraits of others in his in? Yeah, yeah and self self-portrait. Yeah, through through others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I think for both of them, it's uh, it kind of speaks to, I would say, a very ethical dimension of their work. Although I I know the whole, you know, there's the documentary in particular is, is fraught when it comes to um, encountering and depicting the other, and these interviews happen in a short frames of time, and then the editing happens, and of course, there's a lot of complications after. Uh, representation wise but I do think that there's a really strong ethical dimension and that neither of these filmmakers do kind of fall prey to like treating these treating their their subjects in in uh, cliched ways uh, they really both uh, and I think it 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 is also about their their own um, role as artist filmmakers who also write And the fact that this is these are both really kind of different forms of, of film essays, um, not so much with the Tom Anderson in terms of the spoken, but maybe in terms of the sonic, uh, that um, they, they pay very close attention to presenting something that's very, presenting their subject in a way that, that is complex. Um, And that's not often done, especially with depictions of African Americans and Mexican Americans or Latinos in, in mainstream media. I mean, it's always these very stereotypical, cliched presentations. So for both of them, they're very interested in these, these layered, very transcultural, bicultural existences. And I think that's, that's just something both Varda and Anderson have a, a very strong attentiveness to. And it's something that Anya Svarda developed over many years, working as a photographer, uh, documentary, and then into taking documentary into fiction, as she did early on with her films. I mean, in this in this film, almost the the murals themselves are self portraits of the others, of the, you know, in a sense, and of the right? artists of too. Yes, yeah. The, the, so many of them are representational. They're very few, right? Abstract. Mm -hmm. Um, is that is that typical of of the murals? Are there that you know of? I think are there it's like just you know in terms like of Malevich eco murals economic uh, economics of resources and being 
you know, getting commissioned to do something and then having a very limited window of time to do it. So you use a picture of yourself or use your friend or, you know, you use the mirror mm-hmm. because you have this, this it's not the, the opportunity to have, you know, countless weeks to, to, to uh, depict somebody else. And uh, maybe with, with Kent Twitchell being, being uh, a departure to that, but, um, Ken Twitchell's being more commercial commissions. But yeah, I think that is kind of common, the, the use of, yeah, of self-portraiture. In the self-portraiture mirrors. and then also like representational figuralism. Oh, figuralism, yeah. That, is, like, is that just simply linked to the... Show, I think she showed a sliver because there's there are a lot of abstractions. There, mm-hmm. There's, what is that, symbolic surrealism that Italian artist who paints in Venice Beach do. Oh, yeah. You yeah. know, there's, there's these... Strange to conflations of art historical references uh-huh, to uh-huh. you know everything from sur- surrealism to psychedelia, and those those are all very present too. Once you mm-hmm. start looking for yeah, for the murals, yeah, that's, that's true. But she was attracted, I think, to the faces in a way, and she she certainly carries that over in documentor where it's really all about the faces, the bodies, the expressions mm-hmm. of the representational murals. Mm-hmm. I wondered if it had to do also with the muralist interest in a kind of giving face to mm-hmm. themselves, to their community, to their oh, sure. interests, and yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, and a and a and a more historical legacy mm-hmm. in relationship to well, for for many the the connections to Mexican muralism, but others too. There was worldwide a kind of um, third world, I guess, quote unquote, third world aesthetics of. Mm-hmm of making face and having the face, you know, pointing at that, that one that, you know, I'm not a minority kind of that, that confrontation, um, from the, from the wall as well, that speaks out, that's urgent, that's didactic. That's also a very strong impulse. And also the, the impulse to represent, um, a sort of, I mean, this has been critiqued too, the, to present the normative family, usually mm-hmm, kind of heterosexual mm-hmm. normative family too, that's in muralism as well. That kind of comes more out of African-American nationalism and Chicano nationalism, mm-hmm. which has then you know, subsequently been critiqued by gay and lesbians and feminists. But that, that's also part of that figurative tradition as well. Mm-hmm. May, may I ask one last question, if there isn't another, about, about I mean, your as a curator in a museum interested in, um, among other things, Chicano art, muralism is of course a big part of that. Uh, how, how do you bring that into the museum? Have you, have you th- thought about that? Have you done that? Do, are people doing that? Yeah. Do you bring it in terms of documentation or do you yeah. bring in the muralist to? I think it's, yeah, it's something I, I'm even more thinking about now. I was just thinking about that watching the film. Uh, because typically it would be just the preparatory sketches or drawings, and not so much the documentation. But or if it were a portable m- mural, it, that would be something mm-hmm, then mm-hmm. the institution would feel like it, it could collect as as a painting. But I think it's a it's an ongoing problem uh, to think about in relationship to performance, to collecting performance, to collecting video, mm-hmm. um, and. I, yeah, I don't have any easy answers, but it's definitely something I, I see, especially when Judy Baca was saying that she painted these murals on the wall because she never expected to see the work or someone like her's work in a museum. So mm-hmm. that, I think that's still very strong, that kind of um, the divide. It's also this, the problem, too, of representing public art in all, all its dimensions in, mm-hmm. in a more traditional institutional format, which I don't think any curator has really solved this problem. I mean, where I grew up um, in Detroit, there's at the Detroit Institute of the Arts, this amazing right. um, Rivera, Diego Rivera mural in the museum, right. uh, like an homage to the auto workers. Mm-hmm. And that's something I know. Yeah, that no, you the, could commissioning have that, like, the mural. Like the mural the the, yeah, yeah, instead of like I, you know, the Zoom that. tour to build a new building, <laughs> let's have Judy Baca like do a, um, a mural. That's, that's, yeah. That could be good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know we're on the same side. On this. <laughs> I'm on the same side. Yeah. For, yeah, for yeah. sure. Hmm. Okay. Well, yeah. um, 
Oh, uh, I would have another question because I'm, I would be want let you go. I would be really interested in um, for which reasons uh, Anya Swada went to Los Angeles. Do you know about that? Because uh, you you talked about her feeling like an outsider, right. and then she went to the city of Hollywood, right. where she uh, as, a, as a filmmaker in the way she is doing films right. uh, feels more and more like an outsider. I would say. Yeah, well, uh, you know, her husband Jacques Demy both times. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe Mark will talk about the, the late 60s. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> he, w he did Model Shop, which you're also screening. So that's why they ended up um, there the first time. The second time around, uh, I think they were kind of estranged, but he was also uh, trying to, sh to pitch another film, which uh, I don't think got made in Hollywood. But uh, So she went with him again, or she went after him. And so she spent a couple of years there, and it was really because Jacques Demy was had that she had more skepticism, I think, and she still does. But uh, Jacques Demy was attempting to be sort of a crossover uh, because he had been so highly successful mm -hmm. after Umbrellas of Cherbourg, and you know I think he had thought, oh, I could probably transition into into making mainstream Hollywood mm -hmm. cinema, which ultimately didn't happen. She arrived though, and she was. Uh, I was. What fascinates me is when she first got there, uh, she, she was enjoying the Hollywood lifestyle with Jacques, but at the same time, she was chasing after the Black Panthers in Oakland, and she was, you know, on this bohemian houseboat with a distant cousin of hers, this artist Yanko, and then later, uh, you know, with with Viva, and. Uh, so she was always interested in subculture, political cultures. She had much a more much different angle, I think, than than Jacques Demy. But that's why she was there. And and was there any trying uh, for her uh, to get into contact with Hollywood producers to do a bigger movie on her own? Or I think she kind of makes light of it, and she she points to it in Lion's Love, where there's a character played by Shirley Clark, that you know she she did have. She did have some ideas. She had some yeah. things that she was trying to pitch and promote, but she never really. And also, too, I think it was harder for a woman mm. uh, who was considered to be the wife of Jacques Demy uh, and to get any really valid response. Yeah, but she, she just went and did her, her own thing. Art for feminist. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, she, she did. Actually, I'll, I'll mention this in two weeks when I give my talk on Lions Love, but um, I guess just in a two weeks. Little, Is it in two weeks? It's in two yeah, in two. Oh God, I have to write it. Um, but in um, <laughs> but but she does. She did when she went um, in nineteen sixty eight or sixty seven with Jacques Demy, um, and he had this offer from Columbia Pictures to do Model Shop. She also, um, while she was there, met with executives for Columbia, and actually um, they wanted to produce a screenplay. She wrote a screenplay for Columbia called Peace and Love. Um, which um, was rejected then because they, they wouldn't give her final cut, um, which she didn't want to agree to. Um, and because she wasn't, as Rita said, um, as interested in Hollywood as Demi was. And so then she um, sort of kind of thematized that experience in the film that we'll see in two weeks, Lion's Love. <laughs> there aren't any more questions. We would say thank you very much to Rita Gonzalez yeah, thank you. for this presentation. Thank you very much. And to Mark, of course. And uh, yeah, I want to say, oder auf, ich mache es auf Deutsch, die nächsten beiden äh, Veranstaltungen sind dann schon im Wochentakt. Also nächste Woche, ganz spannend, Richard Newport äh, wird von der University of Georgia hierher kommen und über war das ersten Film reden, La Pointe Courte aus dem Jahr 1955. Das ist sehr, sehr empfehlenswert. Auch den Film sieht man selten im Kino. Und dann eben in zwei Wochen, am 16. dann Marc Siegel über Lions Love. Und ja, Ihnen einen guten Nachhauseweg und bis bald. Tschüss. <lacht>